And so with that, we're going to get going, um, but I would like you to give a huge welcome to my wife who's going to help me preach this thing. So babe, come on stage. And bring all your stuff with you. So, All your stuff. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. This is my throat coat. Um, all right, so, so what we're going to do, it's going to be a little different this series because we're just going to... Um, we're just going to talk, and um, w- there's a couple things we want to share with you real quick today. And here's the whole premise of the series. Um, like all of us, like there's this big thing of hashtag relationship goals. In fact, you'll like see stuff on Instagram if you're on Instagram, and somebody will post something that looks something like this right here, um, where not that, but this other picture like this. And so, like you know, you see those things, and then immediately like there's seven comments or 17 comments, like hashtag relationship goals. And the thing that like you have to stop and just ask is, okay, number one, there's nothing about that picture that's real, right? It's carefully edited, it is orchestrated. I'm not saying these people are in, not in love. I'm not saying their relationship is not amazing. I'm just saying there's nothing about this that's real. And so you just have to ask the question, because I've never been driving down the road in my heated car going, hey, I just want to get out and I want to make a uh, hard in the snow for 45 minutes while I freeze my butt off. And then I want a photographer over there so we can take a picture together. Like, that's never been a goal of mine. So the point is, as we start this series, like, you just throw that out there, but there's a subtle problem with the whole relationship goals thing. We never define it. And so we throw it out there, but we don't really know what it is. Yeah, so. and I mean, I don't know if you've ever been one of those people. I mean, honestly, it's this, like, millennial generation that does it. Let's give it up for millennials. But, like, they look through Instagram, and they hashtag relationship goals. And so, like, my question to you would be, like, have you ever thought through what your relationship goals are? Even if you've been married for a long time, if you aren't married yet, if you're in a relationship, have you ever sat down and figured out, what do we want our relationship to look like? Or when we see certain couples that we really admire and respect, what is it about their relationship that we admire and respect? Like, what are we wanting to emulate? Um, so early on in our relationship, um, Bryant was a nerd, so he did a lot of, like, podcasting. He was one of those people I who I could just of- read my way into a good marriage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it did him a lot of good. Anyways, um, so he did a lot of podcasting. And so um, one of the things that he was challenged to do in one of the podcasts was to write down relationship goals. So he came to me and he was like, hey, let's write down some of our goals that we want our relationship to look like. So we did that early on. Um, so some of the things we wrote down is that we wanted to pursue Jesus together. Um, we wanted to serve the church together. Um, we wanted to create a safe home um, for each other and then also for our kids. Another big thing for us is that when our kids... Um, finally grow up and leave the house that they still want to be friends with us and we still want to be friends with each other. That's a big one. Um, And we wanted to learn to fight fair, all of those things. So those were a number of our goals that we had written down. Um, I feel like we hit them all all the time. Oh yeah, on point. So honestly, things are perfect now. That's why we wanted to do this series is no, like here's the reality. Like, and I'll just say this. um, We were talking about it last night. Uh, we've been so, tried to be as open as we could about our story. Our first year was horrible. It was hell. Um, whatever other word you want to describe. Um, so I, I, I want to be honest about the fact of like, we're, our marriage is really good. Like, I, th- I think if you have a, a marriage, you, you kind of think of like, we're the best marriage we know about. Like, and you should feel that way. I think that's how we feel. But I, I, I think there is so much hope in this series because I cannot describe to you how bad it was at the beginning. And um, we had pursued Jesus with all of our heart and it was still bad. Um, everything still went off the rails. And yet God did an incredible work through that. So what I want to say, though, is as good as we think it is now, and it's not perfect. Um, I just told about a fight last week that happened two weeks ago. Um, it, it ain't perfect. In fact, the, the, this is how it started. Here's how bad it was at the beginning of our marriage. My wife wanted to throw herself out of a moving car rather than be in the Y'all car with that. me. That's like right. that's It's true. That's He's how bad. Like, that's just one story. Yeah. Um, you we, broke a sink. I broke a sink one time early on. We had just started the church. We were about, to, I think that's when we were going to go meet with a couple. Yeah. So we were going to go meet with a couple and we sat down um, to dinner with them. They were like, we just want you to know how bad um, it is and how messed up we are to see if you want us at your church. <laughs> I started laughing. I'm like, well, let me tell you a story of what happened before we got here. Um, Literally, I got so mad that I slammed the sink down and I cracked. I broke in half the entire sink, which in that moment, it was kind of like, 
that's pretty cool that I did that. And then at the same time, like, I can't believe that I did that. And so, I mean, but just stuff, I mean, and, and yeah. like, we, I mean, I deleted we, your shows off the DVR. We tell yeah, us all the time. She got so angry one time that she deleted all my shows off the DVR I by the time I got home. shampoo and um, conditioner bottles across yeah, the room. Yeah, so there's all that I mean, stuff. Yeah. Um, and, and, like, there's still stuff, like, I struggle with empathy. So, like, we've moved past a lot of that stuff. But, you know, one of the stories that I'll never forget, or she'll never let me forget, is... Um, <laughs> She was really sick when she was pregnant with, I think, our second kid. And she was in the middle of the night about 3 a.m., uh, which 3 a.m., that's noteworthy. This is 3 a.m. Nothing good okay, happened at 3 a.m. Actually, our second kid had been born. I was nursing him at 3 a.m. while you were sleeping comfortably, but that's beside okay. the point. So I, I go out into the loft. Whatever, we don't need all the details. I go out into the loft, and she's, like, doubled over, and I, I walk out. And this is just, like... What was I thinking? I, 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 I kneeled down, and this is just where empathy, I struggle with empathy, but like in the most empathetic way I could, because my wife, as she'll admit, is a little, like she's got a little drama in her. So I just, in the most empathetic way, I just lean over and go, how much of this is drama and how much of this is real? Now I have to tell you, for those of you that know I had my mastitis, story. And I called the doctor, and it was, they were almost going to put me in the hospital. So I want to let you know, in that case, I was not being dramatic, okay? But, babe, we got to move along. Okay, so all we'll right, stop I'm going to keep going. No, 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 it's my turn. Yeah, I'm going to keep right, going. Go so anyways, so you've got to figure out what your relationship goals are, okay? Obviously, it's not going to make your marriage perfect, but it's going to give you a trajectory. Right now, a lot of you, um, your relationship goals are leading you to relationship destinations that you never wanted because the honest fact of the matter is you don't even know what your goals are. In fact, what's happened is because... Because you haven't sat down and figured out what your goals are for your relationship, whether you're in one or not in one or just coming out of one, um, because you don't know what your goals are, you are living out of expectations. And so what happens is that our relationship goals start to become these really unrealistic expectations of what we're hoping our relationship will look like. And that's why some of you, um, you've been married for who knows how many years and you're like, why is our relationship like not where we had really hoped? and dreamed it was going to be? Why is it ending up like this? Why is it looking like this? Um, maybe some of you are, you've been in and out of relationships and you just can't figure out why you can't make it work. And it's because you've never sat down to figure out, okay, what do I actually want my relationship to look like? What are my goals? What am I working towards? What are we working towards together? Yeah. So here's what we're going to do real quick. We'll go through four or five of these, depending on how much time we have and how long we talk. But I think, um, there's like four, maybe five unrealistic expectations that we've kind of identified because here's the reality. Like a great marriage is not the absence of some of the stuff that we're talking about. Like that's just going to happen in a marriage. I mean, maybe you're not going to try to throw stuff out of a car or break a sink. But like when it gets to a place where it's healthy, stuff's still just going to happen. But sometimes we have unrealistic expectations where literally we've set goals leading to this place or this feeling that ultimately doesn't even exist. Yeah. It's not even the goal. And I, I believe what God's designed for marriage is even better than that. And so um, what I'm going to talk about for a second and what we're going to talk about, kind of like last series, these four things they're not like, I mean, a lot of them you'd identify on the surface and go, no, 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 I don't think that way. And yet we get played by them all the time. Yeah. And there's this underlying thinking, these underlying unrealistic expectations that set goals that lead us to places that ultimately were never even the goal for us. And so real quick, the first one is this, we just want to identify a couple of them, is that being married or in a relationship is going to make me whole. So Jerry Maguire lied. I'm just going to throw that out Yeah, there. no, it's good a good line. line but yeah. I, and I think we can all identify like nobody is fully going to complete me. Yeah. And can I just say, like, if you're a single and God's given you the desire to move to a relationship, do it with all of your heart. But come on, there's no person that's going to complete you. Jesus had a really good run without a spouse. Like, there, there's no individual that's going to complete. And I think there's two huge myths around this. The first one, if I can just speak to singles for one second, is the compatibility myth. That I've got to figure out if, I compa if I'm compatible. And let me just be real straight. This is the unspoken language of our culture. But I'll tell you what compatibility means in our culture. It means that I want to find my dream person, and they're going to be my dream, and they're going to accept me with all my flaws. And then we're going to get into relationship and we're going to work on compatibility. And maybe we're going to live together for a little while. And generally what ultimately happens is I want you to accept me as I am. I want you to work on your stuff, but I don't want to work on any of my stuff. And I'm always going to have one eye out to see if there's a better offer. Yeah. Like that's what compatibility ends up being in our culture. And then the second thing is this for all of us is that we just buy into the right person myth. And then we think that if I meet and I marry the right person, everything is going to be all right. And just go with me for a second, because I know that on the surface we're like, no, 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 I don't, I, but we do. 
And here's how it looks for some of us. There's some habits that we are or we're carrying. There's some anger issues that we were carrying. There's some insecurities. There's some feelings of self-worth that we've never dealt with. There's some multi-generational stuff. And somewhere in the back of your mind, you thought, if, if it's right, if this is the right person, then a lot of that stuff is just going to kind of take care of itself. And then all of a sudden you get into a relationship and you find that that's not the case. And then a lot of people start to buy into the lie of, well, because I'm so angry or because I'm dealing with whatever, I'm not sure if this is the right person. And then all of a sudden the right person DMs you on Facebook from high school. Or you look across the office and the right person is sitting three cubicles down. And because you just thought what's, listen, I just want to say this one thing. Marriage does not solve problems. Marriage creates problems. Yep. And that's because uh, you can laugh. Marriages aren't broken. In fact, marriages are a beautiful picture of the gospel. And we're going to talk about that later. But we are broken. And so when you take two very broken individuals, and that's not a knock on us. If you look at Genesis 3, it talks all about our brokenness. And if you don't buy into Genesis, that's okay. You just look around. You can accept the fact that people are broken. And when you put two broken people inside four walls and say you can't leave, stuff's going to go down, you know. And so we have to figure out how to allow Jesus to redeem our brokenness so that our marriages can be a picture of the gospel. But marriages aren't the problem here. We are. We're the problem. Yeah, and so in, in any relationship, it's going to exaggerate and it's going to expose what you're already coming in with. Yeah. Like, like physical needs cannot meet spiritual desires. And that doesn't matter whether it's a relationship or anything else, but a relationship cannot meet spiritual desires. And a lot of what we are bringing in is spiritual desires. Like I want security, I want wholeness, I want fulfillment, I want pleasure. And all of those things are literally image of God. They're they're God ingraining that in you that you were created for that. But there's no relationship that's gonna fulfill all of that for you. So here's what I would say. Pay attention to whether you've been married 15 years or you hope to be married. That thing of, well, financially, the anger issue, the porn addiction that you're carrying, the insecurity that you feel that gets the best of you sometimes, the I don't feel okay, and then you start to think, well, as soon as we, or if we, yeah. then, then some of that's gonna begin to be solved. I'll tell you what you do in that moment without thinking about it. You make your spouse a surrogate savior for you. Mm-hmm. And, and you start to lean in to go, you've gotta give me peace, you gotta give me security, you gotta give me fulfillment, you gotta give me all the pleasure that I need, on and on it goes. And you crush them under the yes. weight of those expectations. Yes. Because as amazing as my wife is, and she is, she has, like, she's just a girl. Well, like, she, you're an amazing girl, but I, you're, sure. you're not my, like, she can't be my savior and vice versa. And you cannot feel, feel spiritual needs yeah. Um, with ultimately with any physical thing, including a relationship. And so a lot of times we have this just anger. We come in and and we've got this anger issue that we've never dealt with and the infatuation, the attraction is great and we're good for five years and all of a sudden this anger starts to come out of nowhere. And we start to buy into the lie of, I'm not sure that I'm married to the right person anymore because if I were, I, I wouldn't be this angry. No, that's just you. And I think that's the thing you've got to understand is, is that marriages will reveal what's going on inside of you, but then marriages aren't supposed to fix you. That person isn't supposed to fix you. Jesus Christ is. And because you're exhibiting this anger or feeling these frustrations or whatever's going on inside of you, that's not that person's fault. I have news for you. That's your fault. That's been inside of you. It's just coming out. And you've got to take that to Jesus. Yeah. But a lot of times people just cut and run. Yeah. So I'd say two things, right? If you're single, this is one of the best advice, a piece of advice I ever got. It's not original with me, but um, to begin to ask yourself the question, are you the person you're looking for is looking for? Are you the person that you're looking for is looking for? Meaning, are you pursuing wholeness? With, and listen, relationships are amazing. And they're parts of you that, yes, they do complete in a sense. But if, you're, if you start to buy into this lie as if we, if I, then this is going to be okay. I'm just telling you, you're starting to buy into that lie. And you're going to crush somebody under the weight of those expectations. So are you beginning to get whole and pursue freedom and pursue health without a relationship? Mm-hmm. And then the second thing I would say if, if you're married is... Um, like, listen, you've got to lean into this now. And you may be in a place right now where um, you weren't healthy coming in. And a lot of people want to kind of buy into the lie of, okay, well, then I just need to get out of this relationship. And I need some, you know, I need to self-care. I just want to say this. Self-care is great, sometimes misguided in terms of our thinking. If self-care wounds or hurts yes. somebody else yes. or sabotages a promise that you made to them, it's not self-care, it's selfishness. It. And so now, if you're in the relationship, I say this with love, God wants to move you through together, and it may be more difficult, but he wants to heal you. He wants to lead you to a place of wholeness. And so now, you've got to begin to look at maybe where you've been looking at them and what they're causing and what they have brought out of you. And the reality is, this may be a gift of God that you needed 
needed yeah. them in your life to expose what was in you. And if you just cut and run to another relationship, all that's going with you. Yeah, you move from dysfunction to, to dysfunction. That's and, what I heard someone say And so before. part of what God designed for the relationship is yeah. it's going to expose and reveal some things you didn't even know were, it was in there. And yeah. so, um, like, wholeness is available. Yes. But for some of us, we're looking for wholeness in the wrong place. And a marriage is never going to bring that to you. And so what you think is your spouse's problem in terms of your anger may just be that God's revealing what he's wanted to do in your life for the last 15 years. Yeah. And this is the point where you're going to either deal with it or you're going to blame it on them. But yeah. no relationship is going to make you whole. Yeah. Um, we got to move. Yeah. So I don't know if that landed or not. I can't did. tell that you 15. I heard a but, little bit, but yeah, okay. yeah they're kind of silent. I mean, the more you guys give us, the looser we'll get. So if you really want, there you go. If you want us loose, you got to bring it for us. All right. Um, unrealistic expectation number two. <clears throat> um, I can have stability without a firm foundation. Um, so in just a second, I'm going to read somewhat of a familiar passage, but um, I want to kind of lay this out for you first, is that a lot of us, we want to build our relationships on sand and have the foundation of rock. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like sand, we want to build our relationships on sand. So we want to, you know, come to church when we want to come to church. Maybe we'll come together. Maybe we won't. Um, we want to handle sex the way we want to handle sex. Um, I can't tell you how many times we've heard from couples who are dating, engaged, leading to marriage, like we're having sex now because we're just going to get married. It's no big deal. Um, you want to avoid counseling. You um, don't want to pursue the same belief system. Um, I mean, so many different things. You don't want to walk in community. You're building on sand. Yeah. And then um, you get into a relationship and you want all the benefits of the rock. You want all the peace. You want all the intimacy. You want all the security. You want everything that God wants to give you, but you don't want to do it God's way. And scripture says it this way in Matthew 7, 24. <clears throat> Maybe you've heard this song, the wise man built his house stop, upon it. I'm, stop, just, stop. I'm just wondering why I'm not on the worship team yet, but that's okay. Stop. But Matthew 7, 24 says, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. So this is Jesus talking. He's saying, those who listen to what I'm saying and do what I'm saying, you're like a person who's building a house on solid rock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish. <clears throat> Jesus doesn't mince words. It's like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. <clears throat> I should have done some throat coat too. I know. <clears throat> okay, so here's the truth of the, of the matter is that you are going to face a storm at some point. And some of you have not faced any storms yet. You're the lucky ones that are like, man, we're, we're smooth sailing. In fact, we were like that. Our first year of dating, I mean, did we even date a whole year before we got married? Barely. Anyways, um, our first year-ish, like it was perfect. We had like no conflict, nothing. And then we got married. I'm going to tell you, it was a storm. Um, I had a nervous breakdown. That's when we found out I had um, several mental illnesses. Um, it got so bad. He tried to resign. We tried to get divorced. Well, we didn't. I tried to tell you while we were helping people move that I was going to divorce you. But that's beside the fact. I mean, it was a... I think we've told enough stories. I know. Just anyways, okay. It was a bad scenario, okay? Um, but the Lord miraculously worked through that. Uh, we got into counseling, got into community. I mean, we spent thousands upon thousands of dollars on counseling and, um, Jesus really did a miracle. And then we really didn't have a big storm, um, for about seven or eight years. And then 2019 happened and, um, <clears throat> January 4th of 2019, my brother committed suicide. And then shortly thereafter, we found out we were pregnant, which obviously was not a great time for pregnancy, but who knew? Um, Jesus did, I guess. And so we found out I was pregnant. And um, right around that time, mom had just taken a really bad fall. Um, she was in and out of hospice, in and out of the hospital. Um, then we found out I had preeclampsia. And um, then Case was born September 4th. And um, sorry, mom went to be with Jesus September 5th. And um, it was just a crazy, crazy year for us. And I have to tell you that scripture doesn't say if the flood, if the storm is going to come, if, I don't know if it's still up there, but, um, in verse 27, it says when, <laughs> when, and it says when the rains and floods and winds beat against. So scripture in a way it, it's discouraging, but it's in, encouraging because it's saying it's coming for you. Like there's a storm, whether it's internal in your marriage, one of you has a nervous breakdown, whatever the case may be, or whether it's external, all these things come at you from the outside, like it's coming for you. And if you've built your relationship on sand, 
there's going to be a mighty crash, a mighty collapse. Um, Some translations of scripture say great was the fall of it. It's going to fall hard. But if you have built your relationship and centered it on Jesus Christ, then when those storms come, what's going to happen is, is you're both going to be running towards Jesus. And as a result, you're going to run to each other. And you're going to be able to hunker down and you're going to be able to make it through that storm stronger than ever. But you have to build on the foundation and you have to center your lives on Jesus yeah, and Christ. Yeah, I think the thing is like uh, sometimes because the <laughs> first year it was stuff in us yes. and then, you know, ninth year, whatever that was, it was stuff that happened to us. And I think we have this idea that those storms, whatever they are, where, wherever they're coming from, that they can steal Um, those things that make a great marriage. And the reality is they can't steal anything. And that if you have literally placed your relationship on the foundation of we're going to put Jesus at the center, not only does it not steal those things in terms of peace, contentment, intimacy, it exaggerates all of those things. Like you literally get more of it. And one of the things that we would say over this last year is that our relationship and intimacy is closer than it's ever been before through the most difficult moments of our life. And I think because that was nine years of sowing and reaping to be ready for those seasons. And so I would just say this, like your life is going to be centered on something. Um, It's going to be centered on your image. It's going to be centered on you and trying to get your yours out of the relationship, which is a lot of relationships. It's going to be on your kids. Um, It's going to be on your career. It's going to be on something. I don't really have time to do this, but I'm going to do it real fast because I just want to show you this real quick. Um, like whatever is in the center is going is to guide everything else. So whatever is in the center of your relationship is going to lead your values and beliefs. And then ultimately out of your values and beliefs are going to be your decisions. And then out of your decisions ultimately is going to be your influence and your impact. And all you have to do is follow the trail. For some of us, our kids are at the center. And so we are programming and we are constructing our lives around something that should not be at the center. And so we're at a place right now where there's friction in our relationship because we're off balance. We're off center. And it's leading to decisions and actions that ultimately are not leading to a great marriage. Or you've got image in the middle of this. And you've got so much anxiety and so much stress and there's so much that's weighing on your marriage because you've placed something at the center that was never supposed to be the center. And now your actions and your decisions and your impact and your influence are not what you want it to be. And ultimately, Jesus has got to be at the center, meaning like a long time ago, we had to make it a priority. We were going to be in community together. We we were going to spend some time in the scriptures together, like just, God, we want to grow in a relationship with you. We were going to just do different things to where, like, we're talking about it in our home. And and I get, like, you may be in a place to go, well, I have a spouse that's not in that place. Listen, you go first. Like, I can't tell you how many times we've sat down with couples to go, if one of you in this relationship, I understand you can't control them, but if you would just go first, and listen, if if you're a single person, and if you would just start now. God could begin to do something. And so it really comes down to, hey, I'm surrendering my life to you. What does that look like? It's not rocket science. Like, where is God asking you to deal with an addiction? Where is God asking you to root out a habit? Where is God asking you to get into counseling with somebody because there's some stuff from your mom that you never dealt with? Where is God asking you to begin to to make it a priority where like, I'm gonna be in church, I'm gonna be in community, I'm gonna do those things that begin to ignite a growing relationship with Jesus. And here's the thing that I would say, you don't build a life of righteousness in the future on a foundation of sin today. Like your present is going to become your future and it's going to impact every part of your life. And so you need, listen, if you're in a relationship right now, we're like, well, I don't know if they're ever going to make Jesus the center of your life, their life. You go first. And if you do, you have no idea what God could begin to do in that relationship. And if you're a single, I can't say this enough time. You start now. You begin now because you're not going to get into relationship and suddenly you're just going to flip the switch. And I would just say this last thing over this last year, we would never choose that but we would never trade what God did through it. And, and I'm telling you, it's possible, no matter what comes your way, if you're willing to build your relationship on the foundation of having Jesus at the center. Yes, yes. Um, let's keep going. Okay, real quick. Yep. Um, and we gotta go real quick. I can make progress without effort. Listen, here's the real, and I know you, you, you get that lie, but listen, no marriage is turnkey. No. Like it's not plug and play. Can I get a witness at the really quiet 815 AM this morning? So I would just ask, let me ask men this. If you approach your job like your marriage, would you have a job? Snap. 
I'm just I'm asking just, out of love. Like, would you have yeah. a job? Well, and, and a lot of you might be sitting there thinking like, my marriage isn't working. My marriage isn't working. And I, I'm saying this in love because like, honestly, like we're just pretending like you guys are in our living room, you know, and this is like some like marriage counseling with you guys. But some of you, your marriage isn't working because you aren't, you aren't working. And we have a, thank you. We have a very low threshold of pain. Um, especially in the United States of America, because a lot of us have not experienced deep pain. A lot of us, some, some of us have, but we have a really low threshold of pain. And so the moment like our myths of marriage or relationships start to crumble, we're like, we're out of here. We're peacing out. We're going to go find the next best thing. But I'll never forget. Um, I talked to a lady once and she had been in and out of five marriages. And she said, all I'm going to tell you is um, you move from dysfunction to dysfunction because you're not dealing with your stuff. And so that's what we've got. Yeah, I think part of that is because like every great, I mean, every relationship, it starts with attraction. It starts with, I mean, at some level, hopefully, infatuation, all of those things. But, but attraction, infatuation by itself is very volatile. And if it never goes beyond that, like, honestly, there's no commitment in that. It's not fully what God designed. It's both and. And so there's a lot of, well, we just fell out of love. But here's the thing. Here's what Jesus said in John 13, 34. I love this verse. And often, like, we don't get the depth of this where he said a new, meaning literally in the Greek, Greek, it means hidden, meaning up into this time, it wasn't fully known. And people didn't fully know how to love until Jesus described what love, what love is. And I think 2,000 years later, we're, st- we're still struggling with this. And so Jesus said this, a new or hidden command I give you. And you know this verse, right? Love one another. You're like, yeah, I've heard that a million times. But here's what's really interesting. Jesus in this verse takes what commonly is a noun and he makes it a verb. And he says, I want you to go and I want you to verb your partner. I want you to not noun them. I want you to verb them, meaning I want you to go and do it. So if you want to feel it, you ultimately need to go and do it. So you're like, well, well, we're not in love. That's not the question Jesus is asking. Jesus isn't asking anybody, are you in love? He's saying, are you loving them? Yes. Oh, well, 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 we used to. No, no, you used to now. I'm not talking about now. Well, we, we just, we're not, we're not in love with each other anymore. No, no, you're saying you don't feel it anymore. Yeah. And Je- this is why Jesus was able to say one time, just go there and say, I want you to go and I want you to love your enemy. And Jesus isn't a liar. You know why Jesus could say that? Because we don't understand love. Jesus is going, you don't need to feel it to do it. Mm-hmm. And you're like, well, I, I don't, that doesn't sound very romantic. It will be. Like, if you begin to ask the question we've talked about a lot, what does love demand in my relationship with him or her? And then you go and you begin to do that because some of us have bought into that right person myth because the chemistry and the attraction and the infatuation is not what it used to be, which, by the way, that takes no effort. Yeah. You can feel that with a thousand people that gave you their wrong name at a Daytona spring break trip or whatever. You know what I'm talking about? Like, that requires zero effort. But Jesus is going, no, no, what I'm inviting you into, you got to do something. And so if you want to feel it, you got to do it. And the more you do it, by the way, guys, you will do it a whole lot more. Because here's how we think. There's a, we lost this thing. We lost this spark. It's not the same as it used to be. And so our default is like, we just need to spice it up. The sex isn't what it used to be. No, no, Jesus is going, you need to start to do things that make them want to have sex with you. Like that's where the infatuation and the attraction comes from. And you're leaning on something that started at the beginning of the relationship that took no effort. And now he's inviting you into deeper waters in your relationship that says, hey, you could begin to turn the tide on your relationship today and they don't have to do a single thing. They may still be an idiot when you walked out of here. You're still not feeling it. And Jesus said, none of it matters. You can go and make a decision today to begin to do what I'm asking you to do to love them and asking that question, what does love demand and if you do it could change the tide on everything so that's why jesus says go and verb them if you want to start to feel it again go and love them go and verb them i'm not talking about nouning them any longer so i would just ask you this are you willing to initiate and and you need to ask yourself to the question do they feel it meaning i can say it to them until i'm blue in the face but do they feel it do they feel it in terms of money and how i spend my money or how i make them feel about money Do do they feel it in terms of my calendar? Do they feel it in terms of what I'm willing to do to protect them? And it doesn't matter which side of the relationship this is on. And and you don't need to feel it. But they need to begin to feel it. And we'll talk about this later in the relationship. Like, yeah, but you don't understand. Shh, we're not talking about them. This is what Christian marriage is. You're not Jesus' fault. You can ignore all of this. But it's to do for your spouse 
exactly what Jesus has done yes, for you. That's it. And that sounds horrible that's it. until you do it. Yeah. And then eventually you get two people doing it. And I'm telling you, it's the greatest thing in the world. And I'm just gonna end with this on this point. There was a time for most of you in your relationship that you did that. And somehow that went away. Yeah. And I think the last unrealistic expectation that kind of piggybacks on that is um, that I can require more than I'm willing to give. And for a lot of us, um, what we deem to be a healthy or unhealthy relationship is based on maybe how we grew up, um, our personalities, what we've been around, the relationships we've experienced in the past. And so one of the things that you have to figure out is what needs or desires do you have? And I can tell you that those are God-given. Jesus has given you a lot of those needs and desires, but you have to um, figure out how you're expecting those to be communicated because a lot of times what you're expecting from your spouse or your partner or whoever you're in relationship with, um, first of all, we talked about earlier, they can't meet all those needs and desires and they're not sure how you want them met. And so the easiest way I can describe this is um, my dad traveled a lot and so one of the ways he expressed love was he bought a lot of gifts and so early on in our marriage in our relationship um, I thought that that was a normal thing a normal you know experience, expectation of love and I can tell you Bryant loves me very well but not through gift giving that's just not his thing because he grew up with a very low maintenance mom um, which mom come on now but she um, she communicated love through service and time together and so he would serve me and spend time with me which some of you are like I would love it if my husband husband would just clean the bathroom. He's great at that. But I'm like, that's expected, dude. Buy me some flowers every once in a while, you know? Um, and so we had, and then he would get frustrated because I just want to buy him gifts and I'm buying, 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 buying. He's like, woman, just, you know, spend time with me. You know, that's all we need. Save the money. And so our communication of our expectations created really unbalanced expectations. Yeah. So just real quick and we'll be done because it's so important. We're going to do a whole message on this, but everybody comes into relationships with hopes, dreams, and desires. And none of those things are wrong. Again, they're, they're God-given. And so you grew up, and a lot of it's based on what you experienced. My dad did, my mom did, I saw, I whatever. But inadvertently, those hopes, dreams, and desires that are not bad things come into a relationship. And somewhere along the way, and, and sometimes it doesn't happen for years, but there's a shift that happened where all those hopes, dreams, and desires just become expectations that you place on the other person. And all of a sudden, you have a debt-debtor relationship, even in good relationships. And it's, you owe me at some level, and I may never say that. And so it starts to be this quid pro quo. Well, when you do, I will. And, and if you do, I, I will, I'll respond and I'll reciprocate. And all of a sudden you got this debt debtor thing where you put you at the center of the relationship because when you get in an expectations-based relationship where, where I, I want you to whatever, you're at the center, it's about me. And here's what you need to know, and I'll be real quick. Unconditional love requires margin. And what happens when you allow hopes, dreams, and desires that, that could even be good to move over into expectations where I need you to fulfill this. I need us to get here in the future. I need you to whatever. Ultimately, we're gonna buy that, right? Ultimately, we're gonna get to that place. Whatever it is, it could be the day-to-day -day or it could be your big dreams for the future. When those move to expectations, it eliminates the margin to reckon, recognize and appreciate unconditional love. Because all of a sudden, a thing that was even a good desire, it just starts to feel like pressure. It just starts to feel like expectations. And so I just want you to hear me say this for a second. When that happens, a lot of times you don't even know it ha it's happening. All of a sudden, the margin for unconditional love goes away because even in marriages where you're trying to communicate, I want you to know through this act of service, through what I'm doing and whatever, I want you to know I love you. I want you to know I lay down my life for you. I want you to know that this is, this is me going, I'm all in. But in expectation-based relationship, they can't receive that. Because no matter what you do and no matter what your heart is behind it, they just receive it as that's what you should have done. That's the expectation. That's what I thought we agreed on. That's what my mom always did. And so I would just ask you this question and there's so much more I could say, so hopefully you can get it in this abbreviated version. We'll come back to it. But here's one of the indicators to know, and I don't care how long you've been married, 30 years, 50 years, 10 years, two years. One of the things to pay attention to, is there any expressions of gratitude in our relationship anymore? Or do you ever hear thank you? And some of that's weird because you think, well, no, I'm not gonna thank them for that. They, they've done it every day for the last 20 years. So what happens is you've inadvertently moved to a place where this is an expectation. They just do it. And it sounds weird to thank them for something that they do all the time. But here's the reality. My wife, honestly, like most of the time, she doesn't have to do any of it. 
And so one of the things that we, we've really worked hard at, and I cannot stress this point enough, is constantly we pay attention to that. It's like, how genuinely thankful am I for all the things that Nicole does in our relationship and vice versa? Because I'm telling you, there's moments where you just gotta stop because they don't have to do this. I know my mom always did, her dad always did that. This is what blah, blah, blah. This is what we think relationships would be. But anyway, and I'm telling you, when you allow the margin for unconditional love to stay there, it allows you to be able to do things for the sake of your spouse and they actually receive them as unconditional love rather than vice versa, rather than just, well, you're supposed to. That's what you're supposed to. And I'm just telling you, this last thing. For some of you, this is the unanswered question that you have not been able to figure out because it's not hostile but it's just not intimate anymore. And you've inadvertently allowed hopes, dreams, and desires to become expectations for the other person. And you feel like you can't get traction in terms of your intimacy and your relationship. So I just want you to ask this question. If you're in maybe a debt debtor relationship and you didn't realize it, and do not talk about this on the way home. So what I'm about to ask you to do, this is not, you're not ready to talk about it with your spouse. It'll just create an argument. What are some of your expectations? What are some of your expectations? What are some things that have moved into this expectations realm that maybe you didn't even notice it anymore and you don't say thank you anymore and you don't need to share that with them yet? But what are those things? And I'm telling you, if you can begin to create margin again, you'll begin to find traction in yeah. your relationship. I'm just going to go through these real quick just to review and then we'll let, get you guys out of here. But what we've got to do then is define the relationship. You know, those awkward words. Let's define the relationship. So, um, we're going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the unrealistic expectations we talked about. Now we're going to make them positive expectations and give you the goal. Okay. So the positive expectation is being married or in a relationship will not make me whole. So the goal then is, is that I will stop looking for physical relationships to fill my spiritual needs. The next one, expectation number two is I cannot have stability without a firm foundation. So my goal is that I'm going to take the first step to put Jesus at the center of our relationship. Even if you've been married for 25, 30, 40, 50 years, start now, start now. Um, number three, I can't make progress without effort. So the goal is, is that I'm going to determine what love demands before I make demands. And then number four, I can't require more than I'm willing to give. So the goal is that I'm going to choose to replace expectations with gratitude. And if you just started to practice these this week, maybe you just chose one a week over the next several weeks, and you really started practicing these, I can tell you Jesus is going to do something in your life, and it's going to do something in your relationship. Yeah, so I would just say, like, that's what's real. Those are real expectations, and it's good. And what, what I don't want you to hear me say is like, I think in a lot of relationships, we need to raise the standards. And I think there's singles. I just want to talk to you real quick and we'll be done. Because for some of you, God's placed an expectation on, on your life in terms of what he's leading into. And, and it's a realistic expectation. And in our culture, it is so easy to settle. And God's called you to pursue him with all your heart and run after him with all your heart. And then just see who's catching up. See who's keeping up. And you need to make sure you don't lower that standard, but you, but you wait as long as you gotta wait, believing that God's gonna come through when his time is right. But you don't alter the expectations of what God has for your life in terms of relationship. And no matter how Christ-centered you are, it's still gonna be hard at times. So I just wanna say this, for some of you, you're in a place right now where like it's a, it, it's a journey, it's not a destination. And you're in a place maybe you don't wanna be. And I just wanna give you this encouragement. You've sown and reaped your way into the place that you are right now. But what Jesus talks about all throughout the New Testament that is so encouraging is that it's not gonna happen in a minute. You don't build a house on the rock in a minute, but you can begin to sow and reap your way out. Yes. And so if you're in a relationship right now and you're not sure about the other person, go first. Yep. Do what Jesus did for you. And if you're single right now, start now. Yes. Don't wait another day with what Jesus is asking you to do because we believe that there is a God in Jesus who walked out of a grave alive and he can resurrect any relationship, any marriage and any dysfunction from your past and begin to make it new and lead you into a better future. And I'm telling you, we have one of those stories where it could not have been worse that first year and now I feel like it could not be better. And so we just wanna pray over that for the people on Filtered Radio, podcast, live streaming right now and in the house for what God wants to do over these weeks. Would you pray, yeah. babe? Jesus, we just wanna thank you so much for um, the way that you redeem and you restore broken things. That's what you love to do because you're able to show off your incredible grace, love, and forgiveness. 
And Jesus, I just pray for those in this room who are just battling discouragement, defeat, failure. They're frustrated, they're aggravated, they're angry. Jesus, I just pray that we would over the next several weeks see you do some miracles by putting marriages back together, putting families back together, that we would see you heal the bitterness and the anger and the broken pieces. Lord, for those who are single or in a relationship that they're not yet married, Lord, and they're trying to figure things out and um, work towards certain goals, Lord, I pray that they would begin to really think through what they want their relationship to look like, that they would begin to build on the rock and not on the sand. Jesus, we're asking you to do something phenomenal. We love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.